May what I say and what you hear be in the name of God. Amen. What sign can you show us that you can do these things? The, the modern day equivalent of that is who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? That is a very, very good question. And Jesus has given us the answer as far as he is concerned. And that's what I want to do is talk briefly about who Jesus thought he was, but then turn the question around and point it at, at us. Who do we think we are in Christ? Who are we in Christ? So you probably know that the cleansing of the temple is in all four Gospels. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it occurs almost immediately after the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, the, the, which we celebrate on Palm Sunday. John, however, places the story in a completely different location in chapter 2, and he's got a very specific reason for doing so. He's using this story and the resurrection as brackets, and he's given us a clue, the last verse of today's gospel, um, after his resurrection, his disciples remembered what he had done in the, in the scriptures and so on. And so we've got the cleansing of the temple and then the resurrection. And in between, what John wants us to see is that much of what Jesus does indicates that he sees himself as the one on whom all of the authority, the power, the symbolism of the temple now resides. So, and I've told, I've mentioned this before in other sermons, when Jesus forgave people their sins, he did so without requiring the mandatory sacrifice at the temple, as if he had the authority to basically do what the temple does. And by the way, this gives us some insight into the story of the Samaritan woman at the well that, we'll, that we read later in John, John, John chapter 4, when Jesus says to the Samaritan woman that the hour is coming when, basically what he says is the hour is coming when you don't, you're not going to need a geographical location because everyone who is in Christ will be celebrating or worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth. So Jesus sees himself as the one on whom all of the authority, the power, the symbolism of the temple now rests. And of course, God himself was in the temple, in the Holy of Holies. So this is a big thing. This is how Jesus sees himself. Now here's the interesting twist. It doesn't take long for the followers of Jesus to realize that anyone in whom the Holy Spirit dwells is now acting like a temple, right? The, the living God dwells in the temple, but now through baptism, the Spirit of the living God dwells in us. And so we become the temple. Now, 2,000 years removed, it's probably difficult for us to wrap our heads around the significance of saying that. So let me unpack it a little bit and just say four things about what this can mean. So first of all, it means that you are approved. Excuse me, I've got to move this. I've got to move the water a little bit closer. So the first thing it means is you are approved. Let me just read to you briefly a portion from Ephesians chapter 2. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. So now you are members of God's family. Together we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. 
you are approved. You've been brought in to the inner circle. You know, we, we spend most of our life seeking approval, uh, our denials notwithstanding. And the drive for seeking approval runs very, very deep. It can influence the clothing you buy, the car you drive, the house you buy, just to name a few things. And conversely, being rejected can be, well, it is. It, it, it's emotionally devastating to be rejected. And this dynamic of acceptance rejection, I think, is one of the things that, that lies behind the ongoing struggle that we human beings have with, for example, racism and uh, gender discrimination, for example. The, the, this is running deep within us, going all the way back hundreds of thousands of years in our evolution, right? We discovered as, as a species that our chances of survival increase dramatically if we belong to a tribe. But of course, to belong to a tribe means that that other tribe doesn't belong. So it drove a wedge between human beings. So the starting or a starting point for overcoming our tendency to accept some groups and reject other groups is to understand our own acceptance by God. Now you are members of God's family. In Peter's first epistle, in chapter 2, verse 9, he put it this way, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Once you were not a people, now you are the true people of God. The more we can understand ourselves in that light, and the more we apply that truth to the people we see, the better our chances of overcoming the divisions that we have against one another or from one another. So we're approved. Secondly, you're appreciated. And think of it in the financial sense, okay? Here's what I mean. You know, how much are you worth? And what is something, how, what determines value? I used to teach my kids and my kids would say, well, how much does this cost? And I'd say, whatever someone's willing to pay, right? Because that's really the technical answer. How much is someone willing to pay for something? And what determines that? One of the things that determines that is who owned it, right? Who owned it? Now, that's just one of them. The other is just the value that we place on things. I mean, my, my son, Nick, collects comic books. And some of his comic books are so valuable that they're in these plastic sleeves that never get opened. I look at the comic book and I, I think, who would pay anything for this? <laughs> okay, but to, for Nick, these things are extremely valuable. And as a matter of fact, I, as I understand it, there are some comic books that can go for a boatload of money. All right, but to me, they aren't worth a penny, okay? One of the other things, here's the other thing. I, one of the things that I love about the Wall Street Journal is every Friday they have a real estate section, a real estate section called <laughs> Mansions. All right? So I, I read it. It's kind of a work of fiction for me. So you, you look at all these big, 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 you know, multi-million dollar homes, and almost every week someone famous is selling a home. An actor, a politician, a sports figure, whoever. And what's the reason for putting that in the Wall Street Journal? Because they're hoping that there's going to be someone out there who values that owner, that actor, that politician, that sports figure enough to might maybe even pay full price. Right? I went to a, Carol and I went to a silent auction once when we were in Washington, excuse me, in, in L.A., and I believe they were sneakers worn by Shaquille O'Neal. Big sneakers. I looked at them and I thought, eh, but a, they went for a lot of money because they were worn. You know, if I tried to sell my sneakers, what would you give me? <laughs> right? Nothing. <laughs> yeah, I'm, the people on the other side of the camera are going, big fat zero. Okay, right? 
because that's what determines value. Now, where am I going with all of this? What is your value? What is your value? In 1 Corinthians, twice, in chapter 6, verse 20, and chapter 7, verse 23, Paul wrote, you were bought with a price. How much was God willing to pay for you? He was willing to pay with his life. And now, everyone who's in Christ is owned by God. So now, what is your value? And here's a, uh, an exercise to practice. Every morning, go to the mirror, look at yourself, and say, you were bought with a price. And you are God's own possession. Let that be the a Lenten exercise for the, remaining, for the remainder of the season. Third, as a result of, God, of being owned by God, of being God's special possession, you are enabled, you are empowered. Let me turn to another uh, book of the New Testament, to the book of Hebrews in chapter 10, where we read, And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place, because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Because you are now God's possession, you can go right to the big guy, right? You can go right to the source. No intermediaries are necessary. Now, a lot of people pray to saints, and that's okay. If that's helpful to you, great. And the, th the thing is, is that there are also people who look at people like me and will say things like, could you put in a good word for me, Father? Which I'm happy to do, but it's not necessary for you to come to me and ask me to put in a good word when you can go right to the guy, you know, you know, yourself. Go right into the court. That's where all of this comes from, by the way, right? In the, from the time of kings and queens and royal courts. If you somehow managed to get into the royal co court, you had the chance of catching the king or queen's ear. And so if you knew someone who was in the royal court, Okay, that would be a big deal. And that's kind of the way some people seem to look at saints. It's like they're in the royal court, so let's pray to them because God's inaccessible to us. Well, that's not what Scripture says, right? You can now enter heaven's most holy place, the holy of holies. That's what the writer of Hebrews is referring to, the holy of holies because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, you know, one of the Latin words for priest is, uh, I'm going to got to get this right, pontifex. I don't say that word very often, pontifex. And it comes from a word that means bridge. So one of the words for priest describes that person as a bridge between God and people. There's another word for priest, sacerdotal, which actually tends to refer, it comes from the word for sacred, and it refers to the priest as being someone sacred, but it's also used mostly to describe the sacred things that clergy do, like bless, absolve, and consecrate stuff. All right? So the thing is, is that as we've seen, we don't need a bridge. We don't need an interme intermediary because you are now a member of the royal priesthood. That's what Hebrews is telling us. You are a member of the royal priesthood. When I was in Jerusalem, I remember being at the Western Wall. It's hard to describe what it's like being there. You know, you look at pictures or video of it and it's one thing, but when you're there and you're looking at the Jews who are there, you realize that this is a profoundly big deal. 
And it's not just that the wall is one of the last remaining structures of the original temple. It's that that particular section of the wall is as close as a Jew can get to where the Holy of Holies used to be. That's what makes it significant. So there's, you may not know this, there's one section of the Western Wall on the north end that's where people pray and they put the pieces of paper into the cracks into the wall. Uh, that's the, the, the closest you can get to the Holy of Holies. But then on the southern section of the wall, other, completely other things, uh, different things are going on. I saw weddings, all kinds of celebration. I mean, they were partying. It was, it was amazing to see all this quiet devotion, prayerful activity on one end of the wall and this exuberant partying and joyfulness on the other end. What the New Testament is trying to say is that you are now that kind of thing. You are the equivalent of the wall. You are the equivalent of the temple. And finally, you are absolved. You know, I, I once had a parishioner, this is going back many, many, many years to the early, early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, when I was at Transfiguration in Lake St. Louis. I had a parishioner who, whenever she spoke of God, it was always God tell, reminding her that she was a sinner. And at one time, she mentioned this to me, and I, I just said, does God ever say anything nice to you? And she was really taken aback by that. And I said, you know, I got to tell you. I mean, I, I believe that God does convict us of sin. That's not the point. But that's not the only thing that God does. I don't think it's even primarily the number one thing that God does. God will do it when it's absolutely necessary. So I, I'm going to give you homework. And for those of you watching and listening, this is your homework as well. If you struggle in terms of your own identity and relationship to God as you're constantly a sinner, you're constantly beating your breast, yeah, okay, right, you're a sinner, but you need to go and read two things, okay? The first is read Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. And then read Romans 8, paying particular attention to verses 1 through 4 and 31 through 39. And your homework is to read those every day until you believe that it applies to you. And if you want to know what it says, you're going to have to go read it. I promise you it's really good. God has some great things to say about you. You know, uh, Lent is a kind of an odd season. The, the season when we're, we remind ourselves of our sinfulness, we remind ourselves of our need to repent. You know that there's 40 days in Lent. Do you know that the Sundays in Lent don't count? Okay, the, today is not one of the days of Lent. Now, that's what makes Lent odd, because we have you know, special vestments, we cover the crosses, and we, we do all kinds of stuff to remind us that it's Lent. But in fact, what happens on a Sunday is imagine you're, you're, you've got this area called Lent, Sunday's like a bubble that gets put in the middle of it and lents all around it, but the bubble isn't Lent. Okay, this is not one of the 40 days of Lent. This is the Feast of the Resurrection. This is Easter. All right, so even in Lent, we need to remind ourselves that Easter has happened. We are forgiven people. And use that to help motivate you to seek repentance, to seek penitence, and to become a better child of God. Knowing that you can't do anything to earn God's love. You've already got it. You've already got it. Let that motivate you to grow in Christ even more. So we pull all this together. Jesus saw himself as the one on whom all of the authority, the power, the symbolism of the temple now rested. It rests on him. And you, through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, are now that temple, that very temple, through baptism. 
And so you are appreciated, you're approved, you're appreciated, you're enabled, and you're absolved. Amen.